Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say now? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. Romance. Dear romance besties, this season we will be exploring dark romance. That means I need to give y'all a little trigger warning. We are going to be reading books where consent is murky at best. There will be triggering topics of psychological and physical abuse, manipulation, kidnapping, slavery, rape, bullying, bodice ripping, and sexual assault on the page. If this is not your cup of tea, we get it. We have lots of great books for you in our previous seasons and more coming up next season. Without further ado, Shani, welcome to the dark side. Ooh, thank you, Bridget. I'm ready. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Romance at a Glance. I'm your host, Bridget. With me, as always, is my co-host, Shawnee. Shawnee, how are you? You ready to get dark and dirty? Bridget, OMG, I am so ready for season six. Let me just tell you, it was so hard not to talk to you about this already. (laughs) As you know, dear listeners, we do not talk about the books ahead of time so that you're hearing our first reactions. And oh my goodness, I'm so excited just to see what you have to say as we go down this deep, dark season. Shani, you know I have so many I things to say. I know you do. I have so many things You are not a say. woman of few words. I have so many thoughts. <laughs> I am not a woman of few words. I have so many thoughts and emotions. Today, we are talking about Tears of Tess by Pepper Winters and... Guys, as we were organizing the season, one through 10, we basically did it based on how long the books were so that we could record them in a good rotation. And coincidentally, we put Tears of Tess first, and then she was the first author to email back and say she wanted to come on an interview with us. So it was all happy, it's all working out. I'm so happy, let's do this. Serendipitous, let's jump in, let's get it it poppin'. Romance at a glance. Uh huh. Romance at a glance. What you say now? Romance at a glance. Go ahead, girl. It's okay, everyone. As I said, we are reading Tears of Test by Pepper Winters. This is part of a series, book numero uno of Monsters in the Dark. It does continue with the main couple, although I will say that this book felt kind of rounded out. Like I didn't necessarily feel like I had to read book two. Although I am intrigued by book two. Shani. I didn't know there was a book two about the same couple until I was like going through like the reviews trying to pick my favorite review. Oh, yeah. So it definitely stands alone. Tell us a little bit about the narrator and how you liked the audiobook or did not like the audiobook. Okay. well, so I like the audiobook. I thought both of the narrators had really good voices. However, I will say that Jacob was supposed to have a French accent. So he does. He does have a French accent. But sometimes it just disappears. Sometimes sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's American standard. <laughs> and I was like, wait, who's talking? So sometimes you're like, wait, who's talking? Yeah. I was like, is it Q? Is it gangbang? What's going on here? <laughs> uh, so that happened. But both of their voices were fine. Great. All right. So just fine. Happy enough to read the audiobook if the people want to read the audiobook. Yeah, absolutely. Like if the author's like phenomenal, I remember them and I don't really remember them. And I also didn't hate them. So I'm like, they were fine. They were right right down the middle. Great. So as you guys know, we're doing dark romance all season. This book is technically a new adult dark contemporary romance. It's a lot of things (laughs) all wrapped into one little bundle. I don't think this book is new adult, by the way. I mean, I think it is just because she's 20. Because she's 20, it's new adult. But I really don't think it's new adult. Not at all. No, because it doesn't have like the bullying theme or like the sort of like angsty, like, where am I in my life thing that I sort of naturally associate with new adult. Yeah, she gets real dark. (laughs) Anyways, Shani, let's talk about the cover art real quick before I dip into the old synopsis. I thought it was very pretty. It's like soft focus. There's a girl in this lovely looking sweater with thigh highs on. Did not give me dark romance vibes. (laughs) Intensity vibes. I thought it was going to be more from the cover alone. More of like a sad girl sort of (laughs) angsty book. It's kind of the vibe I got from the cover. I would totally agree. I wouldn't put this cover as a dark romance like cover. But I think Tess was such a regular ass, basic ass character. That this fit like this is a basic outfit, like a long sweater and thigh highs. I'm like, <laughs> if you could read basic character, this is a basic. 
<laughs> so nailed it. Uh, are you trying to say she's a basic white girl, Shawnee? That's what you're really trying to say. <laughs> I didn't say it, Bridget, but you know I was thinking it. <laughs> I didn't know you were thinking it. I agree. She was a regular old girl. Let me dip into the snobs real quick so that we can give some context. So Tess has a loving boyfriend, but he treats her like spun glass and she wants and needs to be ravaged, punished, played with. On a romantic trip to Mexico, Tess is determined to finally tell him what she needs from him sexually, but he is not into it and leaves Tess feeling like there's something wrong with her. They're determined to put it behind them, so they take a scooter ride, stop at a local spot where Tess is kidnapped and then trafficked. She is forced into a world full of darkness and terror. Captive and alone, she finds a core will of steel and fights back. But no matter her strength, it can't save her from the horror of being sold to Q, a man whose very desire to force her, hurt her, and play with her lights her senses on fire. But what kind of monster feels desire for their captor? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I have so many thoughts, Shani. I'm like not even sure where to start, but I think that we should sort of go chronologically because the beginning of the book is much different than the second half of the book. That is true. I separated my thoughts. Yeah, the first quarter before she gets kidnapped is much different. So I actually really liked the intro where she's talking about how she has all these fantasies and she like doesn't know how to bring it up to him. And like anytime she like gets slightly aggressive, he like pulls away and gets freaked out and it makes her feel like she's insane and like something's wrong with her. And I was like, oh, sweet baby, I have been you. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I felt, too. I was like, OMG, I definitely relate so much to this, especially like before I got into kink. It led up to me like feeling like I was going crazy if I didn't. And so I definitely have felt that feeling of like, I want to tell them that I'm into this. Or, okay, maybe I'll start with this little thing and then slowly escalate it to this other thing. <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite quotes, she said, I wanted a new label, one that said, girlfriend who will do anything to be tied, spanked and fucked all over rather than adored. And I was like, Yes. Yes. That feels about right. That feels about right. You know, it's weird, too, is like growing up, you always hear about guys being like sexual, like super sexual and wanting all the kinkiest stuff and whatever. And I have found that not to be true (laughs) where I'm like, hey, let's do this super adventurous thing. And they're just like, no, I'm good doing like standard missionary. Like, do I get to put it in you? Cool. Like, (laughs) you know, type of thing. So like his response was in it, Brax. I've met that response before. And so that was definitely interesting. Yeah. When he was like, well, if I'm not enough for you. And then she immediately like he like basically puts it on her to then comfort him and make him feel like more adequate. And I really wanted her to be like, actually, maybe you're just not enough sexually or it's not even like you're not enough. It's just different. Because then at the, okay, I said we are going to go in order. We're not. So then at the end of the book, when she breaks up with him, she says, it's just that we're different. It's not like it's not enough. It's, it'll be great for this other person. You'll be the right person for her, but it's not, I need something different. And I was like, I was happy that in her journey, she got to a point of accepting her kink and her like desires and not shaming herself anymore. Because Obviously, at the beginning, she feels a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and a lot of confusion. And then she gets kidnapped and sold. And then she's like trying to survive, fighting off rapists. And then she's like confused why she is like feeling lust for Q when he's like owns her now. So obviously, a lot of confusing things were happening for her in that span. But I was happy that like at the end, she like came to a positive place about her sexuality. I agree with that. It was interesting to see her again, just at the end of the book. But when she goes back to Brax, they fall back into like the old routine. And that was interesting for me because before I got to the point where, you know, you find out that he's been chatting with the neighbor or whatever, I was like, that's got to be really difficult to, to fall into like an old routine after like I was gone in Florida at my parents' house chilling. Nothing crazy happened. I was chilling. And when I came home, <laughs> I could not fall into the old routine. Like it was like I was a new person and nothing fit. And now I had to find everything to fit again or to rework everything. So they came back. I was like, that's just reading that. I was like, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> that's uncomfortable. I actually thought it was uncomfortable. And I thought her mental thing is like, I'm just going to have to pretend to be that Tess again, like, because I'm not. And what am I supposed to do? And I actually liked that it didn't get lingered on for too long. Like she wasn't there like on the page, at least it was like a month of time. But like on the page, it wasn't like she was there for a year. And you're just like, 
a hundred pages and you're like, for fuck's sake, like, <laughs> move it on. I liked that it actually, she went back, she's there for like a chapter, figures her shit out and then is like, I don't want this and bounces. Yeah. Which I like. Okay, let's go back to the beginning though because we're skipping over all the things. <laughs> yeah, I separated my notes into like, what I liked and what I didn't like. So that's why I'm I'm, I'm going to try to follow along in chronological. Oh, that's tricky. Okay, so one thing I know you're going to agree with me on is, so they go on this scooter ride. First of all, they then have very vanilla sex. And she's like, oh, I wish he would like bite my nipple super hard so I could climax. And I was like, oh, poor sweet thing. <laughs> Not having any orgasms while you're having sex with your partner. But so, so they go on this like motorcycle ride or um, scooter ride and stop at some like random little side of the road Mexican thing. And her instincts are like, run, don't go in, don't do it. But she's still like being this sort of nice girl where she's ignoring all of her own self to appease Brax. And I just want to say this as a PSA. First PSA of the podcast, season six, everyone. Hello, welcome. <laughs> it's gonna be so many PSAs. <laughs> so many. If your instincts are screaming to run, do not feel bad if you feel like it's some sort of racism, if you think it's some sort of ageism, if you think it's some sort of other countryism or like a different culture and you're thinking, oh, well, maybe it's their culture and I don't want to like feel. No, if your instincts scream to run, you run. I'm not saying you run to a police officer and turn in an innocent hurt human being. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if your instincts scream, you need to get the fuck out. You need to get the fuck out. And then you sort through that shit later in your mind. But you get the fuck out. Yeah. I mean, I discovered a long time ago that like politeness is what causes people to become victims. So like you just can't be polite. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't be polite. You just got that's just going to be what's going to be. Yeah. I mean, I know you and I have both, I think on this podcast, even talked about it, but like, I feel like this scenario was me in Turkey at like a little convenience store just across the border. And this man looked at me and I was like, oh, not today, Satan. <laughs> and I looked at the woman behind the cashier register and she gave me the look like, you better get the fuck out of here. And he sat at my table while I was drinking a water, midday drinking a beer. And I like politely made conversation as I was drinking my water because I was very thirsty and I was like, okay, better drink my water, <laughs> better pack my shit up. And then he's like, oh, I have to go to the bathroom, but maybe we can talk more or I'll buy you a beer after. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. He went into the bathroom. The second the door closed, I ran the fuck out of there with my huge bag packs, waved to the lady and she was kind of like shooing me out. And I immediately hitchhiked a ride with this man who I looked at him and I was like, oh, you look so nice, hopped in. <laughs> and he like, I saw him come out of the place too when I got in the thing. And I was like, oh, that man was gonna murder me for sure after raping my cold dead body for sure. So PSA, just listen to your instincts and run. So anyways, she does not listen. Brax gets knocked over the head, possibly dead. She gets kidnapped. She wakes up in a trafficking room with like eight other girls and is of course immediately like degraded and they shower them and put ropes around their neck like they're cattle and one of the guys comes in and tries to rape her in the middle of the night and she like bites him off and scratches him and bites him and headbutts him in the face and basically like keeps herself from getting raped by him see i like this fighter test good for you i like this fighter test too so this is the test that i actually really like here, she's like, they're not going to break me. She keeps fighting. She's like, I'm not going to do what you say. And I appreciated this test. Mm -hmm. Me too. I thought as we'll go through, you guys will understand some of the plot problematic things that I had with this book. But for the most part, it kind of went along with that embracing of like shedding that politeness, shedding that good girl, like I'm supposed to do this. And like, oh, hell no. Like, you're not going to take me like or if you do, I'm going to make it real fucking hard for you. So she ends up getting sold to Q and ends up in this like French estate. And the interesting I thought was that she thinks that she's just going to be like immediately raped right away and like constantly it's going to be horrible. But he sort of like is intrigued by her and doesn't attack her right away, which I think is almost scarier. Like if someone came at me with like, I thought it was going to be horrible. And then they came at me with like, Suzette is there. She works as a maid. She's really nice to her. And it's like, here's some clean clothes. Like, I'll take you to your room. Everything's OK. <laughs> and then he's like ordering her around 
and mean to her, but also like not abusing her yet. And she's like, that would be such a mind fuck. Because like in your mind, she's like prepared to fight tooth and nail, just like she had to in Mexico. Like she's prepared to defend herself. But being lulled into that, like what the fuck is going on? Like that, I think would have been a mind fuck. I thought I liked that part. I thought that worked well. Yeah, I did too. Though like looking back, right? With this whole plot line that like he rescues girls and whatever. It doesn't quite make sense to me that like when she comes in initially and they're like, oh, you need to bow. And then she's like, I don't want to bow. It seems like why would they have forced her and why would they have that? Whatever. That didn't quite make sense to me with how they end up like wrapping it up at the end. Yes. Okay. so we don't find out that he's been saving girls towards the end of the book. So at the beginning, when she gets there, we find out that she was given to him as a bribe and that he accepted it and that he's had other girls there. Yeah, it makes no sense that Suzette wouldn't just be like, look, I was in slavery. He saved me. He never touched me. Like, he tries to rehabilitate us. Like, you're safe here. Except for that, she's not safe, unlike all these other girls. But it didn't make sense that the guard was like, you have to bow. And then, like, push her down and stuff like that. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that seemed to, you're right. Looking back on it, it did not make sense. That's a good point. But anyway, so he does make her bow. He likes the fire in her and it like brings out the dominant in him that he wants to her to fight back. And then he wants to like dominate her and break her, but not really break her, just break her. And we find out through flashbacks later in the story that his dad was an actual sadist and like bought women and held them captive and would rape them all the time and would make them call him master and that they were his slaves and stuff. And he like witnessed this as a very young child throughout the years, like peeking through holes in in the walls and stuff in their giant estate. And I can see where if you saw that as a child, you would know that was wrong. And then when you yourself grew into a man with no one else to tell you like, hey, what he did was wrong and evil and you were right to kill him. Spoiler, he kills his dad at 16. But also that doesn't mean you wanting a consensual BDSM dom submissive relationship is wrong. And I don't feel like he really got there at the end, which maybe that's what book two is about. But I don't think he really got to the place of like, it's okay that I want to dominate her. It doesn't make me evil. At the end of the book, I felt like he was just understanding that it was like possible. And even though part of me wants to be like, this guy has traveled the world. He's done a whole lot. He's like running an empire. I feel like he should know by now that people do this type of thing. You know what I mean? But I'll give him that. I didn't get into kink until I was in my 30s. You know what I mean? So like, I didn't know that you could even like do certain things until then. So I'll give him that. The thing about this book for me, though, is that and I've read a lot of dark romance and this book was a light jaunt through dark romance to me. <laughs> it was, it's a good introduction, right? So if anyone's reading along with us and they haven't read dark romance, I feel like this is a good introduction to dark romance. But really, this all this could have been solved with a consensual BDSM relationship. It is solved at the end with a consensual BDSM relationship. That's the ending. You're like, oh, wow, everyone's okay with it. Exactly. That's the thing, though. Like in dark romance, there's got to be some element to me that nobody's going to consent to. Like there's just no, (laughs) do you know what I mean? And this was just like, to me, more of like a miscommunication book, like where everything could have been solved by one piece of communication. That's kind of how that felt to me. This book, exactly. Yeah, it's consensual non-consent is what she wants. Okay, so I didn't like it, obviously, because it was the worst part of the book. But I did like that through her two actual rape experiences in the book, she realizes like, oh, I'm not sick. I don't want everyone to just rape me. I want this specific person that I'm consenting to to act out that with me. So there's two different instances. So one is fairly early in the book or fairly early in her relationship with Q, where she gets like strung up in this like see-through webbing dress as like some business associates of his are there. And she can like barely touch her toes on the platform and is like very vulnerable. And the giant scary Russian comes over and like grabs her and he doesn't do anything. And then he like hides her from view and ends up shoving the hilt of his knife in her vagina. And first of all, that's horrific. And people are disgusting. Secondly, I would never have forgiven Q for that. <laughs> I don't <laughs> care. I could forgive something that he did to me faster than I could forgive he let someone else do it to me, if that makes sense. 
I was like, oh, hell to the now. This motherfucker better grow. Yeah. <laughs> and he like apologizes. I wrote down the quote. She's like, in her mind, she's like, why did he hurt? He allowed a man to do what he wanted. It was his fault it happened. And I refused to listen to his pain. My own pain kept me plenty occupied. His apologies weren't worth shit. And I was like, yes. But then she forgives him like right away after that. Well, just full transparency. I did not connect with these characters whatsoever. I love dark romance and fucked up shit can happen and way more fucked up than that is in this book. And I can connect with the characters. I didn't connect with them very much. I think there was a lot of indecisiveness for me with Tess that was and the book was driven so much by her inner monologue. And we were in her brain of going big backwards and forward and backwards and forwards. And I was like, bitch, if you don't get it together, like, I'm gonna need you to have a consistent (laughs) thought. Like, it was driving me nuts being in her brain. And I was like, is this what it's like to be in the brain of a white girl? I don't have, what the fuck is happening in here? (laughs) I mean, it's not not what it's like to be in the brain of my brain. So it made me really upset that every time Q fucked up, He would go in his room and listen to sad music really loud. (laughs) And I was like, oh, my God, what a pussy ass bitch. Like, what a little bitch, baby. I just couldn't. Like, it was so emo for me. Yeah, that he was like playing music to her throughout the book and the music. He was like communicating with her through the music. So like heavy metal and sad songs, romantic songs and all, all things sort of in between. I was just like, I just couldn't. Every time that would happen, I'd be like, oh, my God. So here's my thing about, you know, that I get timeline annoyed sometimes. So this happens. First of all, they don't call her a doctor. And I was like, look, motherfuckers, that's a dirty ass knife. You need to get this lady a doctor, some antibiotics. Stat. Secondly, her response to this, and she's always been looking for a way out, but the first opportunity to escape. So Suzette is going to town or whatever, presumably, and the chauffeur is going to drive her. So she hides in the back seat. And as soon as they get into town, they both get out of the car. She gets out. She runs to the near shop, calls Brax, leaves a message and is like, I was trafficked. I'm alive. I'm at Q Mercer's house in the French countryside somewhere. I don't know. Help me. Hangs up. Is trying to call again. The bodyguard comes back. She runs, gets in a car with a stranger who she's hoping is going to help her. And cuts off her tracking device, but leaves it in the car, which frankly is a little stupid. But also, like, if you're panicking and you've been kidnapped, I feel like I was like, that's not the least plausible thing in this whole story. So anyways, these guys turn out to be sadistic fucks and actually rape her. And the only reason he finds her is because the tracking device was in the car and he comes and murders them both and then takes her back home. So all of this, though, happens in like two days. And they're all so upset with her and disappointed that she ran. And I'm like, of course she ran. Y'all are holding this bitch hostage. She just got raped with a knife handle. Of course she ran. I I would have killed you all before (laughs) I left. Oh my God. And then they get so mad that she calls the police. And I'm like, of course she called the police. Y'all are holding her hostage. (laughs) What did you expect? They're like so disappointed in her. And I'm like, no, I'm disappointed in you guys. She got raped two times on your watch. You're like, oh, you'll be safe now. She wasn't safe in your house in the first place. What the hell? Especially like Suzette, right? Like Suzette's such an advocate for him. But Suzette's always witnessed him be kind to the girls. Suzette's now watching him not be kind to her. So I don't know why it didn't throw up flags for Suzette. Yeah, like triggers for her past. Yeah, because she was talking about at the end about like all he, all the good he does for the girls when they come and you see the new girl who's come in and how they're treating her. And they didn't treat Tess like that whatsoever. So I don't know how Suzette wasn't like, yo, bitch, let me get you out of here. Like, just be, lay low, be quiet. Yeah. Or like, I don't know what's going on. I'm gonna figure it out. Yeah. But she was just like, no, go along with it. And horrible thing happens. It's okay. He's a really kind man. Yeah. And I'm like, he's not a kind man. He let someone rape me just now in the house. It just happened. Do you ever feel like sometimes when I read a book, the book makes absolutely no sense that I feel like the author's trying to gaslight me a little bit, like to make me feel like this shit is normal. I'm like, this is not normal. And the thing is, I'm totally okay. Like, I like the Stockholm syndrome. I like those things in books. But I think it was the way Tess was going back and forth and in and out of these thoughts. And then the catalyst for her being with Q was that she got kidnapped and raped by the other two guys and then comes back and then she's on board. She's just like, oh, I'm here. I'm here for this shit now. 
Yeah, I wrote that down. It said Q was right. I was safe with him. He made it so simple. I couldn't comprehend how I ran before. I ran from Q's safety and the monsters found me in the dark. And I was like, nah, bitch, a monster found you in his house. He brought the monster in. He invited it in for cognac. But also in that sense, like I get the traumatic, like you would go back to like that child sort of like, oh, he rescued me and killed the bad guys. So he's the savior. So I was okay with that. Although I agree, she went back and forth way too many times. Then she wasn't on board because then like shortly after that, she was like, "Okay, so wait, before we go too far ahead, I do want to say that he did get major points after she got raped when he like took the shower with her and washed her and like let her cry and took care of her and like soothed her soul and then was like, let me replace the memory and like took care like that. I was like, "Okay, that's the man you want, like throughout (laughs) the whole book. Like you want the man who's going to savage you, but also is going to aftercare you some happiness. And she said something like that, like, you know, if he gives me like some soft, then I can give him the hard. So like if he's willing to like be nice to me, basically, (laughs) then I'm willing to like go into the darkness where I want to be. And then like Shani, right after that, Q says, recognize me, see me. I am your master. My throat closed fighting with injustice. He was my master. But for how long? I don't have a choice in the length of my captivity. I never did. I never would. He would never see me as Tess, a girl, a woman who refused to bow to anyone, a woman who is more than just a fucking bribe. I glared. See me. I am not yours to torment. And I'm like, except for (laughs) (laughs) you want him to torment you, part A. And part B, you just said five seconds ago that he was your master and you'd never leave him and that you were safe with him. But And he was like so sad, the look of betrayal when she called the police. And I'm like, yeah, because you are keeping her hostage. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you call him? Wait, wait, can I just say really quickly, though? <laughs> you call her slave every day, bro, and sexually assault her every day. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just go back because there was a moment in this story where if I could jump into the scene, like if this was real life and I could just step right in a minute and then like just smack Tess across the face and be like, what is you doing? (laughs) When she gets the phone and she calls Brax as her first call or whatever, as opposed to the police, I was just like, what? (laughs) So actually that didn't bug me because I could totally see that like when you panic and you latch on to like Brax will make it okay you know what I mean like the last thing that she depended on it's not like she's in America and she knows it's 911 she's like I, how would she know how to call the police you know what I mean so that actually did not bother me well the thing is she didn't even know if Brax was alive well that was a little problematic because she did not know he was alive but I understand the urge to call him uh, I was like you don't even know if he's alive or not and I, I like that you find out later that he screened the call because he didn't know the number. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that is so perfect. It's probably better that he screened the call, though, because like she was able to leave the message. They could re-listen to it back or whatever. But yeah, I was definitely in the moment like, uh, wait, that's your first call? <laughs> like, and also, OK, OK, there's sometimes in stories where I feel like the authors give us Well, one, I felt like there was so much useless information in this book, right? The lead up to the book where, so in the very beginning, when they're talking about how she feels and her relationship with Brax and all that, for me, that went on too long. They gave me too much information to tell me she was in an unfulfilled relationship. The second thing is her parents. She kept talking about how she was, (laughs) first of all, I mean, this is so fucked up. They accidentally got pregnant with her when they were really late in life and they didn't care about her and whatever. It was a very one dimensional way of describing her, her parents. So they didn't really care what she did. And then after she got kidnapped and they thought she was dead, they cremated a stuffed unicorn or something and scattered the ashes in the backyard and then weren't super stoked and excited when she came back as alive. Like, this did not make sense to me in the story whatsoever. It was just like the bad parents, you know, like, these are my bad parents. And I don't know why she could have just made them dead. That she did not need to have parents in the book. I know she didn't want parents getting involved in the search and rescue. Maybe that's why... She wanted she did it that way. But I'm like, they could have just been dead. She didn't have to have parents. I think they were not dead because they were supposed to point out that like the reason she stayed with Brack so long was that she'd never been chosen by anyone because her parents didn't care and like wanted like at one point talked about like just giving her up for adoption. But they could have still been dead. Like all that could have existed and the parents could have been dead. Yeah. 
I mean, his parents were dead. So I don't know. Maybe she just didn't want a whole bunch of dead parents. And also Q's dad was dead and mom was dead. So maybe she just was like, everyone can't have dead parents. <laughs> there was some other depressing shit that happened too. like Brax when he was meeting with the neighbor. He was like, oh, yeah, I've been consoling her because of insert super tragic event that happened too. And I was like, this book has a lot of tragedy. <laughs> Ah, that's right. Oh, my God. I want to talk quickly about the housekeeper because it just popped into my mind. So the housekeeper was the housekeeper back in the day when he was a child. So she like knew that the dad was a sadistic fuck. And then there's that scene where she comes in and he's having breakfast with her. This is right after Tess gets to the house. And he's like, oh, you have two options. One is that I like use you as a slave. And the other one is like, I just give you a job. And Tess like won't say her name and won't tell him about herself. So he's like, looks like you chose option one. And the housekeeper comes in and like they have like a silent exchange. She describes it. They like stare at each other. And then he finally like nods and the housekeeper's like satisfied and like walks away. But the silent exchange is that he's going to use her. And I'm like, what's happening? (laughs) There was a lot of moments like that where I couldn't quite understand. I think from their perspective, they saw her fire and were hoping that she would save him, as Suzette says at some point later. Like, we saw how strong you were and we were hoping that you would be the one who could finally reach him and, like, stand up to him and, like, draw him out. But also it's, like, fucked up, though, because you're like, but also, like, doing it at your peril. So we didn't care about you as a human being. We just wanted him to be better. So fuck you if it broke your mind. Like, wah, wah. Yeah. I feel like it's a little bit fucked up, right? Because the housekeeper was there with the dad and I'm assuming she wasn't okay with it, but she's getting paid and she needs to keep her mouth shut and do what her job and whatever. So I feel like the staff has seen him try to rescue these girls. And now there's an anomaly where there's a new girl that he's acting out of character with and he's abusive towards. Like, I feel like that's a red flag for the staff. Like, I feel like there should have been a slightly more concern from the staff than there was. Like, don't you feel like his whole job is to rehabilitate these girls? So, like, some of them stay, they said, like, a year. Some stay two or three years. Suzette obviously decided she wanted to stay forever. Like, I feel like for her, he could have looked at her and been like, well, you seem fine. I'm going to send you home, (laughs) like, day one. (laughs) Like, why did he put on an ankle tracking bracelet on her? Like, that stuff all made it seem like he was, like, great. And maybe he did it because he didn't, like trust the neighborhood because there's like some weird fucks out in like the area. So he didn't want them to run away and get harmed. There was one point when he said that he said like that guard was to keep others out, not to keep you in. But why didn't they tell her that right away? Like BT dubs, like there's some weirdos out there who are trying to harm people, like stay inside. I don't know. So I want to talk about some other things such as blood play, Shawnee. Because, first of all, there are a bunch of good sexual encounters. The first one where he's, like, finger-fucking her on the pool table, he, like, leans her over and, like, presses her down. And I was just like, well, that seems nice. What a delight. (laughs) Even though he kidnapped her and it's wrong, it also seems nice. (laughs) (laughs) And she's enjoying it against her better will. And I was like, this is what dark romance is, where you're just, like, titillated by the sort of wrongness of it all, the tabooness of it all. Well, I mean, I love the tabooness of it. That's what I love about dark romance. I'm allowed to like the things that I could never be allowed to like in real life. Also, I wouldn't really want to do in real life. If someone cut their chest and expected me to lick their blood, I'd be like... Let's talk about what's going on in your blood. What kind of disease? (laughs) Oh, that's the other thing, Bridget. That's the other thing. My first thought wouldn't be, I'm going to suck on you like a vampire. I mean, I guess I suck my kids cuts and stuff, though. So I guess maybe I wouldn't care that much. I don't know. Okay, so here's just another side thing or whatever. So when she gets taken to Mexico and she goes for that like gynecological exam and like to get the injection that in her neck and da da da, whatever. This is while she's being kidnapped. This is a gynecological exam by the traffickers to make sure, see if she's a virgin or not. And then they put a tracking tattoo on her wrist. Yeah. And I imagine that they were also checking for STDs or whatever. Yes, they said that. Yeah. But I was like, you can visually look if somebody maybe has genital warts or herpes. And if they're having an outbreak at the moment, then you can detect it. But they did no other sort of detection for STDs. Like, they- <laughs> Like, they're just trafficking people, not knowing any bit of it. I mean, they don't give a fuck. They just are like, oh, she visibly looks clean and she's a virgin. She goes to someone who wants a virgin. She visibly looks clean and isn't a virgin. She goes to someone who doesn't care if she's a virgin. They don't care. They get paid either way. Well, Q, you know, he's supposed to be helping all these girls. He doesn't do any sort of that checking for himself. 
Yeah, where's the doctor? I'm just saying, wouldn't you have a doctor on staff who is like, if you have all these girls who are like malnourished and they've been beaten, and like they probably have like bones that need to be set right. They probably have all kinds of problems and they've been raped all the time. So they definitely need interior vaginal exams and they probably need some minor surgeries in some cases or major surgeries. Who knows what these, what's, what's happening? But he just asked her, like, can you get pregnant? or whatever, essentially. And that's- oh, yeah. Well, I thought that was pretty funny, too, because I was like, are you not going to rape her if she's not on the pill? Are you going to rape her with a condom? <laughs> like, what's your plan here, Stan? <laughs> Bridget, I'm so mad at you right now. Because <laughs> he does literally pause as he's about to fuck her. And he's like, can you get pregnant? And she's like, I'm on some sort of shot or whatever. And he's like, OK, cool. And I was like, Assuming that you, at this point, we don't know that he's really been saving these women and that we assume that he's some sort of evil or semi-evil guy. I'm like, wouldn't you just abort the baby? I mean, I hate to say it, but are you really drawing the line at abortion when you're (laughs) raping folk and keeping them slaves? Because that seems like nonsense to me. It might be inconvenient. (laughs) It's inconvenient. But he's not going to wear a condom. Come on. (laughs) <laughs> come on he's gonna wait for the shot to take 30 days to take effect or some pills to start working no <laughs> no i feel like that would be part of the intake right so like you know if i was a trafficker i love to put myself in these scenarios where if i was a bad guy like kidnappers if i was a kidnapper y'all are doing it all wrong y'all are doing sure. it all wrong <laughs> I, I think that all the time shawnee i think the same thing i'm like you are some dumbass criminals this is how i would do it <laughs> this is how i would do it But like if I were taking in girls, right, because I wanted to abuse them or whatever, blah, 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 I would have a whole intake process before that girl ever got to me. Right. So like they would come into my house, but they get processed. You know what I mean? They go through the doctor. They go through having their shots. They go through having the whatever. It's like once the candy's in front of you, you're like, oh, I want to taste it. And then that's a problem. So, you know, there's a whole intake situation before it would ever even get. I 100% agree. I think the reason that they didn't have such a process was because normally he doesn't attack the girls and want to have sex with them. And so he was surprised that he wanted to have sex with her. He was very surprised. But let's talk about bleeding and blood play, because I do want to talk about the fact that he and she are both very into not only the aggressive fucking and whipping and paddling and spanking and all that stuff, but he gets the scissors out and that motherfucker cuts her and then drinks her blood. And then she cu- he cuts himself and she drinks his blood. And there are multiple times when they have sex where he is biting her so hard on the shoulder or collarbone to like hold her down that he breaks the skin. And I was like, Shawnee is going to love that primal shit. (laughs) That was my thought. I'm not going to confirm nor deny whether or not I've ever drawn blood (laughs) in the act of playing. Wait, on purpose to drink it or it happened? So no, no, it happened. Oh, well, that's different. Who hasn't scratched a fool harder than they should? (laughs) (laughs) So my partner and I engage in consensual non-consent or whatever. And we're primal players, which means it's a lot more of an animalistic type of play. And so we play rough. We play really rough. And so blood happening happens. Now, there are some people in kink communities who specifically do blood play. They do cutting, they do needles, they do, you know, and that's their jimmy jam. It's not my jimmy jam. Like now the sight of blood, I mean, I'm a girl in my period. I like I've bled for two weeks solid. Blood doesn't phase me. So if we're playing and blood happens to happen, as long as nobody is like super hurt, you keep playing, you keep going. When we're done, we'll, you know, why bandage that up or whatever. But I don't have like this urge to like lick up the blood or like, that's not my Jimmy Jam. Good for, what is it? Good for others? Not for me. Good for you. Good for you. Not for me. Good for you. If it works for you, it's not for me. I did like the way she described it, though, that he needed me so bad he broke my skin and that he lapped up my essence. I was like, that's pretty hot. Uh, It's pretty poetic. But the thing is, like, seeing them do it, like, them play and do it, like, that shit can be hot. Like, even though I wouldn't do it in real life, that shit can be hot. The fact that two people want each other so much that that's, like, an expression of that want, it's kind of like in books, She's going to have a lot, of, a lot of little teeth mark scars all over her body. If they keep going. <laughs> I mean, that's what happened. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> She's going to have a lot more than that. 
I know. Can I tell you a funny story about how my one-year-old bit the three-year-old the other day? Oh, absolutely. Molly bit because Kira was like smothering Molly and like with a hug, like just like a toddler aggressive hug. And Molly is trying to wiggle out and couldn't. <laughs> they are so hard. <laughs> Kira had teeth marks <laughs> on her, like a full top set and bottom <laughs> set. It's fucking hysterical. And I was like, Molly shouldn't do that. Molly's getting a timeout. Also, you need to listen if she's trying to get out and let her go or she's going to bite you. I feel like that was a great learning lesson. That was a great learning lesson for everyone. <laughs> I always remember my mom telling me that she had a tiny dog growing up and that dog bit her sister, my Auntie Linda, and my Auntie Linda bit the dog back. And that dog never <laughs> bit anyone ever again. <laughs> So I'm sure Kira will think twice <laughs> next time. She... Kira is strong, though. Like, if she gives you a hug, it's she's choking you. <laughs> so aggressive. She's so aggressive. I'm like, <laughs> at least Molly's, like, getting closer to one and a half. So she's, like, much more sturdy now. But <laughs> it's so aggressive. Uh, Toddler love. It's a lot. So is Q's love. It's a lot of love. It's a lot. This book was fine for me, right? Like, in general, middle of the road type of thing. I'm excited to read darker. Like, I'm excited to, like, really get into some dark ass shit and stuff that's a little bit more cohesive to me, like, story wise, because, you know, me like if things don't start making sense in a story, if, if too many things don't make sense, like it takes me out of the world. Also, like, I'm not sure a lot of these books are stuck in the mind of one person. Or they switch back and forth. So it'll be Tessa's view, then Q's view, then Tessa's view, then Q's view. A lot of them follow this format. And I don't enjoy being stuck in the mind of a character too long. It's like a little less conversation, a little more action. Like I liked when the action in this book happened and I was looking forward to it so much because it meant that I could get out of Tessa's head for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. What did you think about him banishing her? So basically what happened, she calls the cops, the cops come and he tells her or Suzette, I guess, tells her he doesn't even say it. But Suzette says, oh, well, the deal he made with the cops was that they, he lets you go, then they won't follow a report. So he sends her back to Australia. Tell me your thoughts. <laughs> okay. So I actually like that he sends her home. Me too. First time ever. You know, I hate when they, <laughs> when they just arbitrarily separate. But I was like, okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Because one, it gave him a bit of redemption. Like it gave me a little bit to like, like about him, right? And then two, it allowed her to make the choice and the consensual choice of living this like BDSM lifestyle or kinky lifestyle that they're about to go into. And by no means what he's asking for is then I've seen much more extreme play in kink and BDSM. So it's not like some. <laughs> well, it sounded like from the book, like he wants to go much darker, but he was starting her out with like spanking and paddles or whatever. Yeah. He started her out with level one. Everything in this book for me was level one. OK, like aside that they did was level one. I, they did not do anything that I was like, oh, I'm so titillated by this. Yeah, so it was like there was hot in this sex scene, but that's no different than any other romance novel that we've read. I don't think this book was hotter to me than any other romance novel. So when I think romance, I'm thinking I'm going to get some hot shit. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to get some hot shit that I can spread on a muffin. You know what I'm saying, Bridget? That's what... Hot butter. Hot butter. Hot butter. <laughs> hot butter. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this book was definitely not that. But I would say it was like a, it's a solid book. I do think the author... By the way, I think she has so much potential. This was her debut novel, BT Dubs. Yeah, I saw that this was her debut novel and I saw that this was released like 2016 or at least on Audible. So, I mean, she has four more years under her belt. So I think that I'd actually be excited to read a newer novel from her to see how she's grown because she can definitely write. It's just there needed a bit more editing. I think a stronger editor would have really helped this book out. And I think if she was also a little bit more adventurous in the sexual play in this book, it would have helped it out. I have a feeling that from what I read in the description of book two, book two, they like explore more in their relationship. Got you. Yeah, but I need that in book one, man. If you didn't give it to me in book one, how do I believe you're going to give it to me in book two? You know what I mean? Like you like, really give me a good taste of what's to come. That's true. I mean, I was excited because I feel like the next one, they're like going to hunt down all the people who did kidnapped her and stuff. And I love a good book where, like, you know, you got vigilante heroes. It's because you like being titillated, Bridget. You like being... I like to be titillated. And as you know, Shawnee, I don't think that sex and suspense can't go together. I'm like, we're hunting for Mexican rapists and traffickers. Now is the perfect time to have a clandestine <laughs> sexual experience. 
<laughs> no, first of all, let me rephrase that because you did not accurately depict what I'm talking about. You're like, oh, are we going to go hunt down some rapists and traffickers? Are they on the other side of this door right now? A perfect time. Can you be quiet? Why don't you tie me up and so that I can't say, cover my mouth and hold me down. <laughs> Johnny, let's take a quick break on that now. <laughs> we'll be right back. Hello, best friends. Thank you for being loyal listeners of Romance at a Glance. We're so happy to have you. If you'd like to support us further, head over to Patreon, where you can become one of our patrons. We've got a lot of great perks, such as merch and a super secret discussion group where Bridget and I talk to you directly about all things romance and all things nasty. So come on over. And now, back to our show. Oh, Shawnee. I know I always get you with that. What did you think of Tass? Overall, how many stars? Peach booties. What you got? Okay. I gave Tess three peach booties. And this is why. So I guess she definitely was not at a four. She started off the book strong for me, right? And I really liked her up until she got to Q. I was like, I could see that this girl was going through problems at home. She needed someone to really tap that ass in a way that she needed to tap. And she was fighting for it. And she was exploring her mind, like asking questions, trying to be braver in what she was asking for. And I can totally relate. Like you and you're about to say some crazy shit to your partner. So I thought that the test in the beginning of the book is the test I wanted to see throughout the book or whatever. And I felt like I got this, like, I don't know, very wishy-washy, indecisive, stuck, angsty brain for like the rest of the book. And I think that the author could have done that with Tess. Like I could have read more of the second half of the book with Tess being wishy-washy if she didn't make me read so much of the boring part of the first part of the book. By the time I got to her and Q, I was ready for them to fuck. I was like, Q's going to rape her. That's the day one. She's going to come in there. He ain't bowing. She's going to bend over the table. She's going to get spanked. Maybe get a little tip of the dick. Like something right off the bat. So because she took so long to get to that point for me, that when she, get to Q, when she gets to Q's and nothing happens, I was like, well, what the hell am I here for, man? Like, why am I reading this book? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, he like leaves her alone for two weeks. And I'm like, no, what? I don't want that. <laughs> That sounds stupid. Exactly. So so it evened out. Like the strong part of Tess in the beginning, like evened out with the like whiny part of Tess in the second part. I agree. I gave her a three. I liked that she was like freed from thinking something's wrong with her for liking being dominated into like embracing it at the end, coming back for him and being like, no, like I am okay with this with the caveat that you are going to be kind to me and let me in and be a par let me be your equal and your partner in all areas except for the bedroom where you are allowed to do whatever you would like. So yeah, I gave her a three also. I also gave him a three. And I feel like because we were in her mind, like you said earlier, like we didn't get as much from him. Like I didn't feel as connected to him because I didn't get to, like everything was like her reacting to what he's doing or like trying to figure out what he's doing. So we do end up finding out that he's like been saving these women and that he's trying to make up for his dad's mistakes and, and all that stuff. And he did, you know, send her away, even though he clearly loved her and was like obsessed with her because he thought that's what she needed, which the one instance where I'll say that I like that, usually, you know, I'm against it. But I also was like, look, brah, she wants the D. You give the D to her. Yes. If she says she wants it. She asked for the D. She says she wants it. She says she needs it. Don't you keep her waiting. Don't you keep her waiting. <laughs> give it to please. her, please. You'll give it to her now. <laughs> okay. So that's why he yeah. got a three. I agreed with you. I gave him a three for like the exact same reasons. I was like, I don't really know much about this. And there was an epilogue in my audiobook that I'm not sure if it accompanied the first book. I had it too, yeah. You had it too. Okay, that was from Q's like point of view and his childhood. And that's when you hear all about his childhood and blah, 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 blah. So that was the most depth I got from like learning about Q. And I didn't need to know his entire life history during the book, but I could have done with a little bit more of him and so much less of Brax in the beginning. Like there was just so much of Brax that I was like, if I was going to not finish a book, it would have been in the very beginning when they kept talking about her and Brax's relationship. Mm. I didn't mind that only because I thought it did a very good job of setting that sort of like her character evolution, I guess, of like the hesitancy to ask what she wants. Like she's going to like wear, you know, nervous to wear her lingerie. Like she's finally going to ask for it. Like, what would he do? And then like kind of that soul crushing like moment where he's just like, why do you need this? Like, I'm not going to give that to you. And even then her trying to like salvage it still. And like, you're like, 
poor sweet girl. <laughs> but I think it could have been done faster. Yeah, but, well, because for me, Q felt very damn close to one dimensional, right? And he's the main character in the story. Brax isn't. I felt like I got way more history on Brax and like understanding of him as a person than I did on Q. So if you're going to sacrifice one, you know, if you're going to make someone one dimensional, let it be the dude who's not going to be part of the book, who's going to be the throwaway character. But in general, don't make anyone one dimensional out there. Anyone authors listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Did you feel like he was McDreamy and McSteamy? What'd you think? That's a great question. What'd you think? I said he was a make me bleed. <laughs> Or mix spank me. <laughs> I like to get spanking. Mix spank me is a good one. Because I felt like the moments where it was hot, like when they were were getting down and dirty and it was hot, I was into it. Like, I liked the, the Mr. Domineering. But in the other moments in between, he was a whole lot of like a little bitch baby for me. So I don't know where he is, Bridget. I don't know where he is on the map. It's like Carmen San Diego right now. I have no idea where this fool is. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Waldo? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my God. Well, obviously, this book was kinky and had some BDSM and non-consent, as well as, like, a full-on rape and things. The kidnapping slavery variety. Did you have a favorite line in the book? Oh, I had a few favorite lines. So, one of my favorite lines was, I wasn't as wet as I should have been, and the invasion was pleasure as well as pain. I like this line for a lot of reasons, because I felt like young Shawnee, I wasn't always able to speak up like how I was when I was a little bit older, like when I first started having sex, because I didn't know what sex was supposed to feel like. I didn't know that you should be gushing for your partner. You know, like my partner walks in the room and my vagina is like, hey, <laughs> like that's how it should be. And if it's not that way, then one, you probably need to go to the doctor and get that checked out. Two, you might need to reevaluate how much foreplay and things you're having with the partner that you have. But young Shawnee was like, oh, this, well, I'm not really ready, but OK, here we go. And so this line actually resonated when it, when I read it. I was like, oh, so many days of that, like almost ready. And then like we just start. So that's where I like that line. What's one of yours? I know you got like probably 50 over there. I already told you mine, Shawnee. Oh, the only one I didn't tell you yet was the um, I do like a vengeful human being. So the very end of the book is I promise to protect you, ravage you, hunt those who hurt you and give you life you deserve. My fortune is yours. My secrets are yours. And I will give you the corpses of the men who hurt you. And I'm like, that's hot. Also, you're one of those people. So you better reevaluate your statement. <laughs> <laughs> except for me, Bridget. Except for me. <laughs> yeah. Better go kill that Russian mofo. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know why, but like, it makes me so mad that that was like, obviously all kinds of rape are horrible. Her getting kidnapped by those two other dudes. Again, second kidnapping, getting raped. Horrible also. But I feel like not enough horror was placed on that man shoving the hilt of his dirty knife into her vagina. First of all, I 100% agree. If this were a more sadistic dark romance where the person really doesn't give a fuck about the person and anything can happen to them and that's what we're dealing with, then that scenario works fine in that story. But in this story, it doesn't because he was supposed to be protecting her. And that's the whole plot line behind why he is and how he is, whatever. So the fact that he like told the guy to get away, the guy doesn't. And then this happens or whatever. I was like, who's really running the show here? I thought you were like a boss. There's a reason I read all these mafia boss books. Like I love when someone's the boss, when they say some shit and everybody jumps. So I a hundred thousand bazillion percent agree with you. And the fact that because that happened on his watch, I was like, that's hard to come back from. That's really hard to come back from. And not only that, then he was kind of doing that same thing that Brax did where she's having to like console him or he's all in his feelings about it. And it's like, you, bro, you didn't even. Matt, he's like shocked that she runs away after it. And I'm like, yeah. And calls the police after her and like. Adur. You know? Adur. <laughs> Adur. Hello. She can find good dick other places. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, I 100% agree with that. Also, that line that you just read is absolutely one of the hottest fucking lines in the book. It's probably the sexiest thing that he says. You know what I mean? That's why I feel like book two is going to be hotter than book one. I hope so. 
Because, like, if that's the BDE we're going in with, you know, where he's like, we're going to rain hellfire together and just fuck our way through this book, like, that feels like a good place to that start. That feels like a great <laughs> place to start. Also, like, I don't remember the context in which he says that to her. I remember him saying it. But, like, that's the kind of line that you want someone to say when they're, like, balls deep inside of you and they whisper that shit in your ear. You know what I mean? They hold your hair. They're, like, pulling your hair and they whisper that shit in your ear while your neck is arched. I mean, that's how that line needs to be delivered. Okay, and that and that's all I'm gonna say about that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's what I'm gonna say about that. Okay, so I have two other lines. One doesn't matter, but this one does. The key is not to lie to yourself, even while you fake it. And that's a resonant line, just in general. All the lines I I like to pick are because they resonate really well. And that line is not unique to like this book or any sort of dark romance. In life, in general, when you are faking something, anything. Faking it till you make it, like go <laughs> whatever that scenario is. Do not believe your own lie. Don't get so deep down your own rabbit hole that you believe the new truths that you've told yourself. Because I have encountered too many adults who have <laughs> drinking their own Kool-Aid. Yes, don't drink the Kool-Aid. That's a scary thing. I mean, I can't live in a world of delusion. I can't fucks with you like that. So anyways, I think Suzette tells her this, basically a fake it till you make it. And the key is just don't just don't believe what you're faking. And I just thought that was a great line. I was like, snaps from Suzette. Snaps from Suzette, whose character was confusing at times, but snaps (laughs) from Suzette. Okay, so my favorite review was from Chelsea Humphrey on Goodreads. And then it said a lot of things, but I'm going to read the last paragraph. In lieu of rehashing the synopsis, I'll say that the first 40% of the book covers the stage of the story between Tess and Brax's vacation, her being kidnapped and trafficked, and arriving at Q's Manor. The remainder of the book felt a bit like a prologue to the sequel. As I read, I wondered how on earth I could grow to adore Q as much as all the other readers of the series. But clearly there is a point where much more information is granted and boom, swoon. I really don't want to touch too much on the plot, but I will say that I'm very excited to continue to the next book and see these horrible monsters pay for their crimes and trafficking. And she gave it four stars. All right. Did you give it four stars? I did not. I gave it three stars. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I did. I really liked it. I feel like if she hadn't waffled so much, I felt like I really had a handle on her character in the beginning. I had a really good handle on her character when she first got trafficked. I had a really good handle on her character when she arrived at Q's. I feel like the point of like the points between her being raped by the Russian guy and the police, not even escaping, the police coming. I feel like that like 25% of the book was very like up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down with her like feelings and like, oh, I'm going to stand up to him. No, he's my master. I'm going to stand up to him. No, he's the only safe space. He's not safe. I have to run. No, I have to go back. You know what I mean? Like I felt like it was very back and forth. But had that part been smooth a little, I think I would have given it four stars because I did enjoy reading it. I thought her writing style was good. I didn't like, I wasn't like annoyed with the way she wrote or anything. Yeah. So my favorite review, I actually had a hard time finding review. So I picked this one from Tina, and this is a paraphrase. What can I say? This did not live up to the hype for me. I liked it okay. The main heroine got on my nerves with the constant conflict. All right, already, we know. You like to be spanked. (laughs) (laughs) I thought this review was funny. I actually couldn't find a more descriptive review. But I gave this book also a three. I felt like it was a solid book. Like any book where I'd say like, yeah, if you want to like a read, you want to pass some time and you want a solid read. It's a solid read to me. There's so many things that are conflicting in my brain that I didn't enjoy. However, I do enjoy the potential of this author. So I might pick up a newer book of hers to see like what she's writing now. And I do think that maybe the next couple books since like the setup book is always tough. So like, Book two or three, I'd recommend people keep going in the series because you might actually find a nice new gem, especially if they're hunting down bad guys. That's more my speed. I like that. They're hunting them. They're not being hunted, per se, because, you know, I don't like being titillated. So I would recommend that. I also gave the book a three. It's just a solid three. And that's it. Yeah, because she's written like 30 some books now. I'm just like looking at her series. So she has a whole bunch of series and duologies. And so she's written tons of books now. She's got that many books then I'm confident that she's a better editor now. And also she's just getting much better at writing. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think for a debut. For a debut, yeah. Not everybody can be Evie Dunmore. Not everybody can have a debut novel that just out the gate is like, bam. Yeah, or like Sarah J. Moss, where it like becomes a cultural phenomenon. Most people just have uh, bad ones. So the fact that it's good, and I think that's a positive. I think it's a positive. I do. 
And that's it. Shawnee, I feel like this book also, as you said, was like a good ease into it. But I felt like it was really fun because the last season that we did, I was looking for very sexy books, but I purposefully didn't choose books that were dark at all because I knew we were going to go into the dark season. So our last season was like any problems that the characters had were more like miscommunication or angsty or just like maybe they didn't even have problems because it was a novella and they just got to fuck and it was great. So I'm excited that this season, like there's just like new stuff going on for us to talk about. I think it's going to be really fun. I think it's going to be really fun. I also want to preface this, dear listeners. We are not like experts, taboo fantasy. We are exploring it with you guys. So tell us what you think about dark fantasy. Also, if we say something that you're like, well, the reason why this is that way is because of this type of fantasy or whatever, let us know. Hit us on the gram. Tell us. Yes. Hit us up on Instagram. DM us. We always answer. Because I'm open and Bridget... We are both very open to learning about stuff that's just not in our sphere of life. I think it's important that we're never in like a weird echo chamber of information. I want to know what you know. (laughs) Yeah, we've, I mean, we're happy to always shout out our friends on the podcast. If you send us some cool information and are willing to let us read it and tell our listeners about it, we're also very, very happy to do that. Absolutely. Yay, I'm so excited about our first dark romance book together, Bridget. This is very lovely. Yes. I think this is a high five. I feel like this was a fun episode. Yeah, this was very fun. I like this one a lot. I can't wait to talk to this author. Oh, my goodness. I know. I'm excited. First of all, her name is Pepper Winters. Secondly, she's friends with Nalini Singh. So that's fun because you guys know we love Nalini. And if you did not catch that interview, it was awesome. And she lives in New Zealand. So we got another Kiwi author coming on the old pod. Woohoo! New Zealand in the house. <laughs> all right. So I think that's all we've got for you today. So Bridget, until next time. Shawnee, may your books be your lover. And your hand your best friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Good dog. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our channel to get new episodes, clips, and more. And click here to watch our previous reviews and author interviews.